Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Perez Art Museum, Miami. My name is Marie Bickles, and I'm the Director of Education. Tonight, we are presenting the online version of our Local Views at PAM program with artist Rosa Nade Garmendia. This live virtual Local Views program is presented with the generous support of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation and features Miami-based artists sharing their practice and discussing works of art on view at the museum that connect in various ways to their own work. This casual 30-minute conversation takes place every Thursday online at 6 p.m. via Facebook Live and YouTube Live. I would like to extend a sincere and heartfelt thanks to all of you joining us tonight. As a 21st century museum dedicated to representing the diverse multicultural communities of South Florida, the Perez Art Museum Miami continues to strive to be a forum for open, honest, and at times challenging dialogue while creating understanding through the power of art. Before I introduce Rosa, I would like to acknowledge and thank the incredible team of people that work so very hard to make these programs come together online. Thank you to Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult Programs and Audience Engagement, Alan Mueller, Membership Manager, and of course, our world-class AV team, Denise Faxis and Andrew Berg. We couldn't do this without each and every one of you. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Rosa Nade Garmendia, born in Havana, Cuba, is a socially engaged multidisciplinary artist who produces work at the nexus of contemporary art and activism. Her work is rooted in social issues and her process is an investigation, using art as a tool, as inquiry and critique of society, stemming from the intersectionality of her identity as a woman, immigrant and industrial worker. She pursued her studies at the University of South Florida, Parsons School of Design, University of Miami, Vermont Studio Center, and the Fort Lauderdale Art Institute. She is also the recipient of many grant awards, including the Wavemaker Grant, an Artist Access Grant, a Direct Support to Artist Grant from Ulay Arts, and a Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator Grant, among others. She was a selected artist in the South Florida Cultural Consortium and Ellie's Creator Award recipient in 2018, and has participated in the Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator Artist Fellowship programs to Suriname, Jamaica, Antigua, and Guadalupe. Rosa is a member of Common Field, the National Performance Network, Visual Arts Network, and the American Alliance of Museums and serves as an artist on the DVCIA, the Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator Board, and continues to participate in cultural exchanges, artist residencies, and exhibition programs across the Caribbean and the United States. She has also been a teaching artist at PAM since 2008. As you watch along this evening on Facebook or YouTube Live, please post questions for Rosa. She would try to answer as many as possible in the Q&A portion of this evening's presentation. And remember, if you value this and other programs presented by the museum, please consider supporting us by going to pam.org backslash donate. So with that being said, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rosé Made Garmendia. Thank you, Marie, Anita, Lazaro, and the entire team that makes live virtual local views possible. I'm very pleased to have this platform and share with all of you a bit more about myself and my artistic practice in these unique times that we're living. My pronouns are her, are her, she, and hers. I want to acknowledge first the land where I work and live, the traditional land of the Takesta, the first peoples of this region, especially in the context of what we are experiencing today. It's been six weeks since George Floyd was killed by police and we've witnessed the public outcry across the nation. We're also at the end of the 18th week of the new normal COVID-19 pandemic. And here in South Florida, we've seen unprecedented um, high numbers of infections since Sunday. And then there's art artists, cultural practitioners, and the relevance of art in such circumstances. I want to share a bit about myself, my background, and how I've gotten to where I am today, because I think this is important. Our social interactions, discourse, and our experiences make us who we are. My life, and in large part, my art practice, has been a continuous exercise 
in the search for identity. This is particularly important when one has been transplanted and uprooted from their family, their history, and their native culture at a young age. The shared culture, shared history, and ancestry that folks who have been in the same place for generations hold in common. It is this identity which, um, as an immigrant uh, like myself, must excavate, discover, and bring to light and express. For me, identity is a production that's never finished. It's always in process, and it's a bit complex, and it's always evolving. I'm sharing with you two quotes here um, that I discovered through authors um, and two local uh, scholars. Not lo one local scholar, Dr. Danette Francis at the University of Miami, and Dr. Alex Pierre, um, who's out at Spelman College. And it's uh, through the writings of the African diaspora that I continue um, to search and to define myself. Um, and I'm very um, thankful to have them uh, to be inspired by. While I was pursuing my master's degree, uh, two things happened that changed the course of my life as an artist. One of them was uh, listening to Dick Gregory speak on racial justice on campus. For those of you who don't know him, never met him, uh, he was a comedian and an activist. He protested the Vietnam War and racial injustice. The first time I heard him, I was really like shocked, really. I was um, very surprised um, at everything he had to talk about. And the second thing that happened while I was in art school was uh, during the summer, I wanted to join the Peace Corps, but I was rejected because at the time I was not a US citizen. So all of this was sort of in the context of struggling to sustain myself as an artist against the market forces. So I left school and I traveled and worked uh, my way through the Northeast of the United States, the Midwest. I traveled abroad. I worked in construction. I pushed back planes at the airport in Miami. I worked in a print shop in New York. And during this period of growth, um, I became an activist. Actually, my first protest against police brutality was in Minneapolis in the late 1990s. And for many years, I kept my activism and my art practice separate, part of my fragmented self. But that changed six years ago with the death of Michael Brown. My artistic practice is rooted in social issues and particularly the intersectionality of my identity as an immigrant, a woman, and an industrial worker. I'm committed to creativity, activism, and social change, and I consider my artistic practice a daily act of resistance. So I wanna talk a little bit about the project I've been working on for the last six years. It was another defining moment. There's been many, but there's been some specific important ones. Um, the night that I was driving home um, from my studio, I heard on the radio um, that 18-year-old Michael Brown had been killed by police. He was unarmed and left for hours on the sidewalk. And what happened in Ferguson changed me. It pushed me to ask myself, what could I do? What could I do as an artist? And that's when I decided um, I would live more completely, more holistically, and reconcile my activism on the one hand and my artistic practice. The genesis of this commemoration project began that night. Rituals of Commemoration is a project that serves as a space holder, a memory legacy that will ensure that the names of victims of police brutality are not forgotten, giving the lives lost dignity and respect by creating a physical space of remembrance in a symbolic acknowledgement of a terrible history and a very difficult present. I wanna talk a little bit about the research because the research is a crucial and time consuming part of this project. As an artist, researching is both creative and systematic. It's a studious inquiry and examination. It's an investigation aimed at discovering and interpreting the facts, a revision of the accepted police versions of what happens in light of new information, information by family, by witnesses, and by neighbors. It is work undertaken to increase our collective knowledge. It involves a collection, the organization, and the analysis 
of information that I hope increases our understanding of this issue. It's crucial information we need to know about the human beings that were killed, how they were killed, why were they killed. I've been in this process for six years. I've recorded 1,301 uh, black lives killed up to today. The overall figures, 5,468, which includes white Americans, Latinos, and what they classify as others, which I'm not sure what that means. Um, there's not enough data. This project documents black men, women, and youth killed by police or security guards from 1979 to the present across the United States and its territories. The research resources include national databases, news accounts, social media postings, writings by scholars, and museum archives. The Washington Post is the most credible data there is that I found. They began to log every fatal shooting by an off by an on-duty police officer in the United States since January 1st, 2015. And this is actually a conservative figures that they have because the criteria does not include security guards, does not include undercover cops or off-duty police officers. The post investigations found that the FBI undercounted fatal police shootings by more than half. This is because reporting by police department, it's voluntary and many departments fail to do it. And I can't help but think how many people are killed by police whose deaths are not captured by camera or recorded on video. In my research process, there's a lot of cross-checking involved. I organize the information by years and the information is at different stages. It's a daunting, overwhelming task that I balance with the process of inscribing the names of victims upon the bricks. I hope that this research challenges the generalized acceptance that black lives don't matter, that it's okay to be killed by police in the streets, in the park, in a parking lot, in your home, in your car, in the afternoon, at night. There's really no end to the concrete circumstances and the systematic neglect by the systems of power on this issue. I balance the research with the process of inscribing the names and dates on each brick. The process of aligning each letter, counting each letter, may, making sure that their names are centered on the brick, carefully and diligently making sure I lay out the entire name. Nathaniel Harris Pickett, 2015. Sometimes, you know, I get confused because I've already inscribed the name of Jerome, of Jamal, Clark, Terrence, but you know, it's a different Terrence, someone else by the name of Clark or Jamal. So there's constant um, cross-checking uh, the information to make sure that it's correct. I also work um, bits and pieces, some hours one day, sometimes three days will go by and I, I, I haven't been able to work on anything. I've chose Helvetica, which is a sans serif font because it's straightforward in appearance. It's easy to read. I usually lay out names in four or five or six bricks before I head outside to spray paint and begin the process of distressing the bricks. After much thought, um, I selected the colors Hunt Green, Espresso, paprika, colonial red, carmine, cinnamon, cinnamon, warm caramel, nutmeg, and canyon black. These are spray paints. Uh, there's a lot of layering, weathering, and drying time in addition to the final glaze. The process is ritualistic, it's repetitive, and numbing. It helps me cope with the overwhelming number of instances of tragedy and horrific, unnecessary death. Preserving the memory of each individual on each brick to ensure that the names of victims of police killings are not forgotten is important to me. The sheer number and circumstances are an important key to this social problem. 
The current iteration of rituals of commemoration includes almost 500 paved stone bricks. Each brick is uh, about four inches by eight inches and two inches deep. Each brick is painted and individualized. The bricks are made of durable, dry cast concrete. You know, it's available, I get it at Home Depot, it's not precious and it's affordable. At first, um, the bricks were stacked reminiscent to a wall, but this was around 2014, 15. And then the conversations around the wall that's being built between the United States and Mexico became very prevalent. So I didn't want any to be associated with that. So I started to think about other ways that I could present um, the name bricks. So they have become columns. In some iterations, the installation includes a wallpapered background with a similar brick design and PowerPoint projections with photographs, names, dates, and facts about the atrocities, and also information about the human beings killed. The different iterations of this memory project have been a learning opportunities for me in different respects. When I'm able to travel with the work um, and engage with visitors um, as I encounter the installation, it helps me to internalize the depth of the social issue. You know, people have questions, folks, we have prejudices, there's disbelief, and there's also indifference. This image and the next one um, are from an exhibition that closed in March of this year, Intersectionality, Diaspora Art from the Creole City. It's an exhibition of 25 artists from 17 countries that explore identity and intersectionality. And it's curated by Rosie Gordon Wallace and Sanjit Sethi. This is an, another view. And this exhibition was really, um, really good. And I, I was very lucky to be able to be at the opening and engage folks in Washington, DC in a lot of con conversation. Um, but since then, in the last uh, in the last six weeks since the protests, the conversations around this topic have changed drastically, as I'm sure uh, a lot of you know. So the pandemic, working during a pandemic, um, I continue to research and to document. Um, as of today, July sixteenth, twenty twenty. 1,010 people have been shot and killed by police. Although half of the people shot and killed by police are white, Black Americans are shot at a disproportionate rate. Um, here I'm sharing some images of sketches um, and uh, a column I'm working on right now. I've been working with Julian Pardo, a really talented local artist. There's a lot of very talented local artists um, He's been working with me, or I'm working with him, um, engineering the column design so that they can be taller and stru structurally sound. So this is uh, some of the sketches and, and then um, the actual uh, columns and as I work on them. I've been very lucky. Um, the past few months, I have been able to come to work in my studio at the Laundromat Art Space. And I'm getting ready um, for the opening of intersectionality, diaspora art from the Creole City at the Harvey B. Gant Center for African American Arts and Culture in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'm also working on other projects. I wanted to just talk briefly a little bit about some of the artists and art movements that um, while I was in school and I continue to look at and research. Um, so Dada or da Dadaism as a movement, you know, uh, has been very influential. And I keep going back to some of the artists, uh, you know, it was a movement that included literature, the visual arts, manifestos, um, the theater, graphic design, and they focus on anti-war politics um, by rejecting the standards of the times in art through a kind of anti-art um, cultural works. I also, um, you know, Marcel Duchamp, you know, father of contemporary art, I think, um, is someone um, that I worked, I looked at and read about and, and you know, influenced by. 
lesser known artists like George Groves. Um, my role as a teaching artist here at PAM since 2008 um, is like going to school every day. I love learning and I have the opportunity to, to learn about artists from all over the world. Um, I facilitate conversations with visitors. There's a lot of um, research involved and I really uh, love that. I encountered Dora Salcedo at Pam, uh, her work and her also. Um, while I was working as a teaching artist, her work is deeply rooted in Colombia's long history of social and political conflict. Um, I look, I visit other museums and galleries, of course, and last year I had the opportunity to, to learn more about the Afro-Cobra artist and the Black Arts Movement of the 60s. And of course, I also uh, follow Cuban contemporary artists on the island. I want to acknowledge the community and the grant support I have received in the last couple of years that has enabled me to keep doing this work, but especially um, Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator and Rosie Gordon Wallace as the director and curator because they have been very supportive of this project and of myself um, when no one else was really interesting, interested in this topic. Um, and what I would like to do uh, is um, to just finish up is uh, invite uh, folks. Uh, it's my desire that folks find their own place in the struggle for racial justice. And I wanna thank you for your patience and attention. And I think um, we can take some questions now. Thank you so much, Rosa. That was a really amazing detail of your, your practice and process, and we really appreciate it. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I'll get right into the first one, which is from Alex Estera asks, Rosa, you talk about living your life more holistically by fusing your activism and your art. Do you have any suggestions for others and how to infuse activism in their everyday life? Hmm, I think it's a, it's a difficult road. Um, because um, many times as artists or just individuals, we're not, um, we're not um, directed, we're not encouraged to be political beings or to get involved in social issues. So I think, uh, you know, folks have to arrive at that on their own. But I think in these times that we're living, it's easier to do that, to really have opinions about what is happening and to, to figure out and, you know, folks have to decide that for themselves. And it's a journey and it's a, and it's a struggle and it's not for everyone. But I think uh, th the times today are actually encouraging a lot of people, not only artists, to, to pay attention and to react and do something about what is happening. I don't know if I answered that, but. Thank you. No, I think that's a great answer. Um, Angela Bolaños Osorio asked, uh, Rosa, how have your travels and fellowships to Caribbean countries and Latin American countries influenced your work? Well, you know, um, I think if, if everyone was able to travel, if they were economically able to travel, I think uh, we would live in a very different world. Because when you travel, it opens your eyes and your experience to different ways of doing things. So whatever you took for granted, whatever you were taught, that this is the way this is because it's always been like this kind of falls apart. And you learn that there's many ways to do things and you find connections um, among peoples, among cultures. I mean, it's been, a, I've always been a very curious person and I'm curious about other people and other cultures as part of my own way to figure out myself, who I am. So in concretely um, traveling to the Caribbean with the Asper vibe has just been like, tremendous you know we go for a week 10 days and we're just uh in embedded in in the culture we visit artists we do exhibitions we visit museums uh, and it's just a i mean an incredible experience it's very addictive and uh and it's just has helped so much um for me to grow as a person as a human being thank you i definitely agree travel is eye-opening um, Charlotte Evans asks, 
where are these bricks being displayed now and what made you pick bricks? Cool, good question. Yeah, I didn't, this project started off as a coin project, um, sort of two sides of the same story. Uh, it's called two sides of the same, two sides of the same coin. And it started off as a coin project where I, I, I was looking at the dollar coins and um, in the front of the coin, there was the face of the individual killed by police. Michael Brown was one of the first designs. And on the back of the coin was the, the country that the United States invaded militarily during the same time. I tried to manufacture to get the coins made, but they cost a lot of money. So in my urgent need at the time to use art to discuss this issue when it wasn't really a popular, I looked at, you know, uh, when we go to schools, to hospitals, bricks are used, name bricks to recognize funders. And I thought, you know, that um, bricks that are accessible, that are cheap, can be transformed and I can use them as a way to memorize um, folks. So that's how the brick idea, I was accessible, I could do it, I didn't need a lot of money and I could address the topic in a timely manner. Um, and the second half of that question, I'm sorry, was? It was what made you pick bricks? So that it was accessible? Yeah. Yeah, and right. because I saw it around and I thought, okay, I'm gonna steal that. I'm gonna use mm -hmm. the bricks. Right. Um, another part was where are they displayed now? I think you're having an a show, upcoming show. So, you know, um, intersectionality is actually traveling around the country and it's gonna open in North Carolina um, in September. It's gonna be traveling to Tampa and to other cities. And it's my desire to continue to add and expand on, um, on, on the installation. Okay. So yes, North Carolina in September. Thank you, of course, pandemic permitting. <laughs> um, let's see, Darwin asks, hi Rosa, can you share what your long-term plans are with rituals of commemoration? Are you looking to make this a permanent, permanent installation? Um, so in addition to the installation that is uh, shared in white cubes, museums, or artist-run spaces. Um, the last two years, I've been uh, working on a permanent um, public monument or counter monument in Miami that will be a place where people can gather, can reflect, and it could be visible to, to the public. So in the last two years I've been working, I, I, I received some grant money to, to make some research. I was able to, to travel to mm, Montgomery, to the Peace and Justice Museum. Uh, I traveled to DC to look, look at monuments. Now there's a lot of conversation about monuments, counter monuments. How do we preserve memory? How do we preserve history? How do we tell the entire history, not just aspects of that? So that's what um that's a long-term project. I'm actually trying to build a committee in South Florida that will help me to realize that. So I'm working on a on a public work of art in this city that commemorates Black Lives, and and I'm working on other projects also. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's see. Shire asks. How do the families of these victims feel about the names of their loved ones being put on bricks? So this is a really good question. And I've been asked um, if I contact the family at all. So until now, until the last six weeks, I, I see my role. The families already know what's happened to their family members. They've had to live through lies through misinformation, through all kinds of things and the loss of their family. So I don't contact the families when, since I've been working on this project. But of course, in the last six weeks, everything has changed now. Um, and in moving forward, especially if it's a public work of art, um, there has to be more of a community um, conversation because some folks might not want um, the name of uh, their lost one in a public space. When I went to Utah 
um, to show this work, we, the museum organized a workshop and some folks came. And through that workshop, I met a family um, of uh, descendants of indigenous people of the islands, the Pacific Islands, and um, their brother, so they're not African-American. Their brother was killed in court. Uh, while in court, he was reaching for a pen in his pocket and the cop shot at him and killed him. And I included um, the name on that brick because, um, you know, there's a lot of families affected by police violence, Latinos, Native Americans. Uh, so, and it was a reaction. People have come to me also who are not African-American and want their names on a brick, their family members to be remembered. So there's different opinions about that. And it's something that, uh, it's a work in progress and it's a, con a conversation to continue and to have. Thank you. Um, I think you answered part of this question in the last one, but uh, I think there's a second part to it. Morel asked, uh, does Rosa ever reach out to the victim family members about this project and has she gotten any pushback in the process because of her cultural background as a Cuban or otherwise? So I don't reach out to the families. Like for example, um, Trayvon Martin's, you folks must should know, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin's family have been very open they've spoken at um at their uh, at the book fair they've done a film to tell the story of what happened from their perspective so there are families who are very vocal and who uh, who want support and who sometimes see a person who's not african-american who sort of uh supports their fight for justice and some people are surprised by that some people are angered by that um and I've had uh, not many, very few folks, you know, ask me, well, you're Cuban, you're not black. Why are you interested in this? But um, it's because of my personal experience as other and my personal experience as an immigrant and an immigrant from a particular Caribbean island that I know and I can understand and I can be an, an ally to social struggles. Um, you know, I'm an, I'm a, I'm an activist, so you know the civil rights struggle, the the fight against apartheid in South Africa. Folks need allies, allies that maybe are not um, don't necessarily live the same experience. But uh, in moving things forward and changing society, the leadership comes out of the community most affected. But we have to build bridges and allies, and I'm an ally in the struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Um, let's see, we have a question from Rosie Gordon-Wallace. She asks, where in Miami would you like this pub public monument to be installed? And what materials would you use? Well, um, you know, so I visited a, a lot of different places. And because I, until March, I worked downtown, you know, Bayfront Park and um, what is now the Maurice Ferre Park, uh, I, I walk around there, I look, and I really, uh, after researching other places, I really sort of, I'm interested, and I want to uh, do this public project in this place, because downtown Miami is like, is like the cultural heart of Miami-Dade. It's a public space where it should be available to everyone, when I visit the parks, when I've been doing research and walking around, I've noticed um, the monuments that are there. For example, there's a whole row of monuments across from Bayfront Park to very important Latin American figures, uh, Bolivar, Jose Martí. We won't talk about Columbus. Um, so all these Latin Americans, Nicar Nicaraguan uh, leaders in South America, there is a, an array of public art uh, abstract. Um, there is a, a monument to Julia Tuttle. There's a lot of green space. And so this is green space uh, that should be more inclusive. It should reflect. And it's, that's my initial um, idea. But like I said, I'm putting together a committee, sort of like a friends, uh, folks who are, um, you know, cultural producers in the city 
who are interested in racial justice, who are knowledgeable about art, um, to actually to talk about what what they think and what um, what they would suggest, even though public art doesn't work that way. Public art gets decided upon and is never seldom consulted with the community, um, usually. So Bayfront Park, but Thanks. it's a work in progress. I hope you can make that happen. And I look forward to seeing it uh, on our way to work. <laughs> um, so I think we'll wrap up with just one last question that we have from Santiago. She asks, can we speak on sustaining mentally and emotionally through the years as an artist, woman, and activist? Do you feel more, vul more vulnerable to threats or harassment due to your work? Have you experienced any due to your work? Hmm. So, you know, um, so, Activism is a funny thing because people get upset. And even though we live in a supposedly democratic society, tolerant and where people can express their points of view, in practice it's not always like that. Um, so um, one of the reasons I didn't mix my activism with my art practice was precisely from fear of um, expressing myself on certain issues. But I find that today, um, art is uh, one of the more democratic spaces where people, individuals, and artists can actually comment on uh, social issues from different perspectives in a safe and brave environment. So art is a, it's like a shield. So yeah, sometimes I'm worried. Sometimes uh, people don't like what you do or what you say, what you think. But you know, um, so just have to keep doing what um, what I think I have to do. Great, absolutely understand. And thank you for doing that work and so much for sharing it with us today. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Thank you, Rosa. Round thank of applause, virtual round of applause. Thanks everybody for joining in and being patient. Thank you. Thanks.